Hi, Ellen. So um, you just got back from the Libyan-Egypt border, and um, could you tell uh, what you were doing there? Sure. So we went with a psychosocial team to be to conduct an assessment um, of the psychosocial conditions on the border, and then to see what type of services and programs were needed. Um, we ended up staying past our assessment period and immediately implementing some of the programs and just helping to coordinate some of the um, organizations that were there and disseminate information to the communities that were passing through or stuck on the border. Yep, and why did um, you personally end up going? I actually ended up going because as part of the team we are just going to be a very, very small team and they needed a French speaker. So I speak French and then we had an Arabic speaker and then we had two Bengali speakers also and that's who we went with. Yep. And um, how many people are coming across the Egypt border from Libya per day? Um, right now statistics are still kind of off, but um, I would say just under a thousand people. Uh huh. And how many people total from uh, from which date to whatever date they calculate? Right, them? starting from the 19th of February 2011 until I believe it was yesterday, there's 119,000, um, give or take some. Uh, total. That includes Egyptians and Libyans, and being that it is an open trade border, we're not sure how many of those pass through, you know, how many times a day, but 119,000 approximately. Uh -huh. And um, the people who are not Egyptian, who are coming across the border, who are from other countries, um, what other countries have you seen represented? So we had large populations from Malia, from Nigeria, Guinea. Um, the largest one, though, however, when we were there a few days ago was the Bangladeshi. Um, they should have all left by now, though, hopefully, so they're all back in Bangladesh. But a lot of Africans and then Chadians were starting to come over also as we found the Chadian border was extremely difficult and dangerous to cross. I see. And um, what's happening to the people who are not Egyptians who are coming across the Egyptian border? What's the process for them? So the process for them right now is that they have to stay there. And if they have documents, um, the port immigration authorities can process their documents, such as the passport, for them. However, since many are migrant workers, they don't come with documents or the documents were left in Libya. Therefore, um, with the ICRC, the, in the International Committee of Red Crescent, um, they can issue laissez passes with the help of the government or the what, what are those? A laissez passer is basically a one-time travel document that's internationally recognized. Um, it deals with, it's an embassy consent saying that we recognize this person, they're allowed back into the country. So it's a one-time travel document. Yes, and um, do the people have to pay for flights to get to their home countries? Um, if you pay for your own flight and you come with your own flight, you go right away. It's a matter of hours that you pass through the border. Um, however, no, the general migrant population there does not pay for them. They're all chartered flights through the UN or through um, other international governments. So they're free? Yes. Yeah. And uh, what happens to their passport when they come across, if they have, happen to have a passport? So they just they turn it into immigration. Immigration then gives it to the International Office of Migration, IOM, um, who will then book the charter flights. And as soon as those flights can be organized, then the people are put on buses and put through. However, at first that process was rather slow, and people stayed anywhere from 3 to 10, 11 days on the border. Um, how are these people on the border being fed? Um, there's many donations coming in. World Food Program just arrived, but otherwise it's the Red Crescent that's been donating, UNHCR. Which is the Red Cross, right? Um, similar, yeah. Um, so there's different, and then more recently some um, religious groups have started to donate. It's actually sadly a non-nutritious diet of just two pieces of bread, like a really small French bread loaf, and then some Vashkiri cheese with a juice box. And they're being fed that twice a day. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, uh, what other groups are working at the border? What 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 systems were you working with in, in your work trying sure. to help set up? Um, we were working a lot with the UN staff. So we have UNHCR, which is the High Commissioner for Refugees, UNICEF, which is the Children and Women's um, Program, um, IOM, the International Organization of Migration, Medicine du Monde, World Health Organization, World Food Project, like I said, just showed up. Save the Children just showed up. Um, Caritas has been there. Caritas Lebanon also. Um, so there's a number of larger UN bodies and then some other larger international non-governmental organizations. Um, would you say things are well organized or is it still somewhat chaotic? 
Sadly enough, I think an emergency situation says that it's an emergency, it's a crisis situation, and crises can't be nicely organized. It's a rather ad hoc um, operation, and it continues that way. And I think even humanitarian aid workers aren't necessarily emergency workers. Um, and so it's, it takes a lot of different personalities to pull something like that off, and it's very exhausting. I mean, 12, 14 hour days in less than stable conditions and less than humanitarian conditions is just exhausting. And so I said, overall, I think there's still room for improvement, but we're getting things done. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you.